Peter, I think you must be one of the most moral people in the world. You've certainly got one of the most uh, logically thought out ethical positions in the world. And yet precisely because of its logical consistency, you seem to get a lot of flack coming from two quite different directions. Well, that's certainly true. Um, on the one hand, I'm critical of the attitudes that people, most people in society have towards animals. I think that we don't take in the interests of animals seriously enough. And in a way, I think it, it's an implication of, of Darwinism that we should take them more seriously, or at least that it breaks down some of the barriers that have separated us from animals. But on the other hand, because I don't think that humans are, are special just in virtue of being a member of the species Homo sapien, I think that if you have humans who are, for example, uh, severely damaged at birth, um, that it's not wrong to end their lives. So I think that in some cases, uh, human beings don't have a right to life uh, because they don't have the possibility of having a worthwhile and meaningful life. And so, of course, I get flack from uh, conservative uh, moralists and uh, conservative Christians uh, from that perspective. Well, that seems to me to be completely logically consistent. I suppose there might be some people who invoke slippery slope kind of arguments and say, well, it's absolutely right that a human vegetable actually suffers less uh, from b being killed than a, than a fully sentient cow. But nevertheless, once you allow the, the barrier to be broken against uh, sort of breaching the, the barrier around Homo sapiens, you then open the way to a slippery slope, where is it going to end? Yes, people do make that kind of argument. Um, I'd say that, in fact, uh, we, we cross that boundary inevitably anyway. I mean, even when we redefine death to say that people whose brains have ceased to function are dead, although the organism seems to be alive, the heart beats, the blood circulates. Uh, and of course, we did that so we could take their organs and give them to others. I, I think, in a way, that's already crossing that boundary about the so-called sanctity of human life. Uh, and of course, we turn off respirators on people at certain points. We, we, we just don't really keep people going just because they are living human beings. So um, I think, in a way, we, we're already on that slope. And what we have to do is make sure we don't actually slip further than uh, we want to. But I think we can carve out some exceptions. You know? Yes, well, I would agree with that, too. Um, you used the word animals, but I suppose what you should have said is non-human animals. Absolutely. I, I, yes. Uh, often when I write, I use that term, although of course it gets uh, a bit long-winded. But precisely the, the point is that we recognize that we are animals. And of course, once we recognize that, then we have to ask the question, well, well what's so different about us? Uh, I mean, admittedly, we have uh, you know, capacities to reason and to use language that exceed any non-human animals, although I do think some non-human animals can reason to some degree and can communicate in various ways. Uh, but, I mean, that's not enough. For me, what's crucial is uh, that we share with them the capacity to suffer. What's that famous quote from Bentham? Ah, uh, right, yes. He says, uh, he asks, what can trace what he calls the insuperable line between humans uh, or beings that matter, uh, that can't morally, and beings that don't? And he says, uh, you know, well, suppose it was uh, uh, reason something. He says a horse is, is more reasonable than a, a human infant. And then he says, but suppose it was o were otherwise, uh, why would it matter? The question is not whether they can talk nor whether they can reason, but can they suffer? Can they suffer? Yeah, I think that that's, yes. that's crucial. Yes. Do you think that, I mean, a lot of people say, but there really is something special about about humans. I mean, I think we probably agree that there are plenty of special th things that are special about humans, as indeed there are special about various other other species, but what do you see as special about humans? Well, I think that humans, to a higher extent than any other animal anyway, can see their life in, in what you might call a biographical sense. That is, you can look back on the past and think of the things that you've done, and perhaps more important, you can plan for your future. You can say, what will I do tomorrow? What will I do next month? What will I do next summer, for example? Even, you know, how do I want my career to go over several years? I don't think there's any non-human animal that thinks about those sorts of things. And so that, I think, can make a difference if you're just focusing on the wrongness of killing a being. Uh, so I think if a being has that capacity to plan their life into the future and you kill them without their consent, you're doing them a wrong, which is 
arguably a greater wrong than you can do to some other yes. animal that doesn't have that capacity. Right, so I, I understand that, that very well. So it's n the, the act of killing is less bad for a creature that, that has no concept of future anyway. And perhaps another thing that, that might make it better to kill certain non-human animals than human ones is there might be a difference, not in the capacity to suffer pain, which I bet there isn't, but in the capacity to, to mourn for uh, for the relatives for their, or for loved lost ones, lost loved so on. ones, or something. Yes, like that, although so. I, I imagine you'd, you'd agree that you know there is evidence that uh, animals can mourn to some extent. Uh, that uh, I think Jane Goodall recounts one of the chimps that uh, she was observing had a baby who died, and the, the mother carried the, the corpse of the baby around That's with right. her for some time. Yes, um, and there's stories I don't know how well documented there about elephants that come back and pause at the bones of one of their group that has died and uh, seem to be showing some sort of respect. Th they're very mysterious stories and there does mm. seem to be something in that, yes. Mm. It's very interesting. In the abortion debate, people sometimes say uh, it's absolutely crucial when the embryo can first feel, feel pain and they look at things like the development of the nervous system. What I've always felt about that is no, no doubt it's true that we should worry about that, but a human embryo, when its nervous system is just developed, can almost certainly feel far less pain than an adult non-human animal and therefore there is a, a massive inconsistency between people who uh, who place great weight upon the exact moment when the human embryo starts to feel pain. Well indeed that's absolutely right I think that uh, certainly a, a pig or a sensitive animal like that would be much more aware of its circumstances and capable of feeling pain than, than a human embryo um, and the other thing that's relevant to the abortion issue is that I think for any woman, having an abortion is a serious decision that she will only do if she has something quite important at, at stake. Whereas, I mean, people who are prepared to just go into the supermarket and, uh, and buy some ham um, don't need to do that at all. They could easily eat something else. And so they're, in fact, uh, supporting the pain that is inflicted on those animals during their factory farm lives and uh, in the process of slaughter uh, for a very trivial reason. Um, and so they certainly shouldn't be looking askance at, at women who have uh, terminate their pregnancies for much more serious reasons, uh, uh, at least not on the grounds of pain that might be inflicted on, okay. the, an on the fetus. There's an argument that's attributed to Russell, which goes something like, if you carry this line of thinking to its logical conclusion, we wouldn't be eating oysters and, and lettuce leaves and things like that. Well, I mean, I, you know, Russell was a great philosopher, but he said some things that were a bit silly, and, and that's one of them. I mean, lettuce, le you know, I'm, I'm sure that lettuces don't feel pain at all. There's no evidence to suggest they could. I'm also really quite doubtful whether oysters can feel pain. I mean, okay, so maybe they're animals, and people might say, well, if you're prepared to eat oysters, you're not really a vegetarian or a vegan. But um, I think they, you know, their nervous systems are very rudimentary, and, and I would doubt that they could feel pain. So I'm not really going to focus on that. But, but it seems to me, and I, I'd really like to hear where you stand on this, that, that when we're talking about vertebrates, um, uh, the, particularly the animals we eat, the, the pigs and cows and chickens and so on, um, there's no doubt that they can feel pain. And there's no doubt that they do feel pain in the way we rear them and produce them. So. That's why I don't think we can ethically justify eating them. I mean, I think really once we accept the sort of the Darwinian picture that we're not somehow a specially created species that's been, you know, got a God-given right to rule over the other animals, we really have to move uh, towards uh, not buying all of these products that come from animals uh, and that really embody the suffering that those animals experience. Yeah. Um, on the oyster question, I would, what I would say is that we don't need to draw lines and that we, uh, we, it's perfectly okay to talk about a continuum. Mm -hmm. And if, if oysters feel pain, they probably feel a very small amount of pain, right. uh, whereas pigs probably feel a, very, a great deal of pain. And when, when people say, where do you draw the line, I say, why do you have to draw lines? Why don't you just say there is a continuum of capacity 
to feel pain. There's also a continuum of capacity to feel the other things that we were talking about earlier, like mm -hmm. uh, ability to foresee the future, see what's coming, uh, to, to be bereaved, and, and that kind of thing. Once again, there is no need to draw lines. Right. You can, you can think of, just as we've got a, a continuum of all those things, you can say we have a continuum of moral responsibility. And our moral responsibility to oysters is quantitatively less than our moral responsibility to pigs, which is quantitatively less than our moral responsibility to humans, um, to the extent that humans differ in, in just the respects that you, that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. What those respects are, intelligence doesn't seem to me to be relevant per se. Um, a capacity to feel pain is highly relevant, and I suspect you're right that it's, there's no evidence to suppose that it's any worse, any more painful for a human to have a knife drawn through his throat or something okay. than, than for a pig. So the only justification I can think of for uh, eating meat, and I confess that I do eat meat, uh, is, the, is the one you raised earlier which is the difference in ability to know what's coming, ability to feel fear, ability to feel bereaved, and things like that. And I think you're almost certainly right that although the position I've just laid out would be defensible if the animals were killed without a, the slightest idea of what's going to happen, if they were going to sort of the, the proverbial bullet in the back of the neck when you're not looking, mm -hmm. of course that isn't the way, the way it happens. The way they're kept in factory farms, uh, and um, the way they're herded into slaughterhouses. I, I don't know much about it, but I suspect it's unconscionable. I think it is, and, and in a way I do think, I have to say, if, if you do eat meat, I think you have a responsibility to know something about it, because yeah, you surely don't right, want actually. to support something which, uh, you know, m maybe not only just sort of wrong slightly, but, you know, some causing really serious and prolonged suffering to beings who, you agree, can't morally. So I, I don't think we can just sort of turn our heads and say, you know, please don't tell me about it. That, that's too much like the, yeah, the, I agree with you. the good yeah, Germans yeah. who, you know, yes. didn't want to know yeah. what was happening yeah. to those Jews who were being... Yes, you're, you're a much somewhere. more moral person than I am, and, and, and I, I, I have, to, have to say that. Um, there might be other people who would say, or, or many people who would say, um, but where does your morality come from in the first place? As I said, you're perhaps the most moral person I, I've ever met, but where does it come from? Why don't you... Suppose somebody were to, were to say to you, well, you don't believe in God, obviously. Um, so why do you care? I mean, wh what's, the, what's the origin of your, of your concern for the, the pain that uh, other sentient beings feel? Um, for me, what um, living ethically is about is, is about not just thinking about yourself, but putting yourself in the position of other beings who are affected by your action. Um, so this is the kind of sort of golden rule, as it's sometimes called, of, of you know, putting yourself in the position of others and asking what it would be like. And of course, you know, Christians will say, well, that comes from Jesus, and, and Jews will say that also comes from the, from the Bible. But in fact, it's something that you find in, in any ethic. You find it in Confucius. You find it in uh, Hindu, uh, early Hindu writings. Um, uh, so I think it's, it's, it's something that any tradition of ethical thinking that gets developed to a certain point that starts to take, if you like, a, a broader perspective, sometimes you could call it you know, a point of view of the universe, will start to realize that, well, I'm just one being here among a lot of others. And there's nothing so special about me that somehow my sufferings are more important than your sufferings or, or anyone else's suffering of the people out there, or for that matter, of the animals. So. So we get to the point where we say, um, really to live ethically, you have to try and think what it's like for those others who are affected by your action. And you know, if you say, well, why care? Of course, it's possible not to care. But then you're just cutting yourself off from a part of reality, uh, which is there. You're, sort of, you're denying that it matters when you, know, when you look at it as objectively as you can. It's obvious that it matters to them as it matters to you. It's certainly a hugely more moral position to take than somebody who says they're only moral because the Bible tells them to be, or they're only moral because they're frightened of God or frightened of going to hell or something. Right. I mean, of course, you know, some religious uh, morality is in a way uh, selfish, uh, just that you don't want to be punished in the afterlife, you want to be rewarded, and that's a, uh, uh, yeah, that's a kind of self-interested position. But if you actually thought that, well, you're kind of inspired by God's example, I, I suppose 
I would also worry about, well, what kind of example is God really setting? Because if there were a God who's all-powerful, of course, he doesn't seem to care very much about <laughs> yes, suffering. Absolutely. And, and that's, that's not the kind of uh, person that I would want to follow, I think. I, I quite agree with you. Uh, do you think that our undoubtedly deep feelings of moral caring that you've, you've mentioned, do they have a Darwinian origin themselves? Uh, to a point, <coughs> I think, but only to a point. See, I think what's happened is that um, we develop feelings of caring for others, um, well, as, as you've explained so well, uh, at least initially with our kin, um, and perhaps with those whom we can enter into reciprocal relationships. And um, maybe, you know, because we lived in small groups that were closely related, maybe then for that group as a whole. So, you know, you could say, well, on a Darwinian basis, there's no reason to think that you would get to a sort of universal altruism, but you would just have this more limited kind of uh, altruism to those who are close to you in some way. But I think what happened then is that we developed the, we developed the capacity to reason. And the capacity to reason also, no doubt, develops for Darwinian reasons. It helps us to survive in many ways. But um, it's a capacity that actually, you know, you can't control in that way. I would say <laughs> evolution um, having, once, once that capacity has evolved, we use it to think out things, some things which are very handy for our survival, some things which maybe are not. But, but we can't stop ourselves, once we've got the capacity to reason, from seeing this, this point that I mentioned, that we are just one being among others, that those beings can suffer, and that from some sort of rational or objective point of view, there's no reason to think that their suffering is less important than yeah. our own. I think that's right. I mean, you could even make a, a version of that argument that didn't involve reasoning, but involved a kind of unconscious misfiring of the instinct, or whatever we call them, that derived from the time when we lived in small groups. Mm -hmm. So if you start from the time when we lived in small groups, natural selection would favor a kind of rule of thumb that says, well, be nice to everyone, because everyone means close kin in that early environment. Well, now, a rule of thumb is all that natural selection can be expected to favor anyway. And so when you are plonked into a much larger environment, like this village here of New York, um, where the people that you meet are not your close kin and the people that you meet are not in a position to reciprocate probably ever again, it doesn't matter. The rule of thumb is still there. It's, it's rather like sexual lust. I mean, you... you um, Sexual lust was put into our brains at a time when copulation tended to lead to reproduction. Nowadays, copulation doesn't tend to re lead to reproduction because we use contraceptives. But the lust hasn't diminished. Right. Uh, and similarly, we have a lust to be nice, which dates from a time when it did have Darwinian survival value. Uh, and so, as you see how the argument plays out, yeah. um, y y y you're making it a rather more sophisticated version, saying we actually, it actually spills over into our reason. I'm wondering whether, in spite of our reason, that if, if we really reasoned it through, we might end up being horrible and, and selfish. But uh, nevertheless, the lust to be nice is still, still there and keep breaking through. Um, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think, you know, obviously reason builds on things that we have, and we have to have some of this compassion or concern to be nice somewhere. Um, but I... I, I don't see reason as necessarily just uh, promoting our, our narrowly self-interested ends. I also think it's possible that um, we have other rewards, you know, that perhaps because we've developed these cognitive capacities in various ways, um, we want to get some sort of fulfillment out of life. We don't just want to eat and reproduce and, uh, you know, maybe get the simple pleasures that we can get from that. But, but we would like to feel that we've contributed to the world in some way. And that perhaps also is a kind of motivation for non-religious people to feel, yeah, my, my life will have more significance and I will feel better about it if I feel that somehow, through living, I've made the world a better place than it would have been yeah. if I hadn't lived. I, I mean, I totally agree with you. I was kind of playing devil's advocate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Peter, I want to come back to the question of, of food and, and vegetarianism and things. First, let's go to an extreme. I, I suppose it would follow from, from your logic that there, that there should really be no objection to cannibalism, provided the, the human victim, uh, I suppose, either given his consent or, or um, has, has been accidentally killed and, and maybe... What, what about eating roadkills? 
Well, I mean, yes, if, if you're not responsible for the death and, and your practice of eating it is not going to encourage uh, you know, drivers to kill more animals, um, I don't think there's any problem with roadkill. Road human roadkills. Well, I mean, then you get a question, I guess, of, well, what do the relatives think of it? And, and would the human have wanted this? You know, maybe most people would not like the idea that they would be eaten after they die. And we do try and respect people's wishes for after they die. We, you know, follow their wills and, and so on. Um, and, and so we should. I mean, that's, yes, that, yes, yes, that does that, seem right. Yes, because that reassures us, for one thing, when we're alive, that, you know, uh, yes. we won't be treated with contempt, uh, at least for that reason. Yes. It's philosophically a bit more difficult question to say whether someone's wishes should intrinsically be respected after they die and are no longer there. But, but yes, in general, it's a, it's, a, it's a good practice, I think. Yes. Um, and so that might be one reason why, you know, if someone didn't consent, we wouldn't want to eat them. But, but intrinsically, I think, there's not a lot of difference between cannibalism and, and what we eat. And in fact, there's a, a late 19th century uh, animal advocate called Henry Salt who lived in England and described the English diet as cannibalism with its most heroic dish omitted. <laughs> yes. So, uh, you know, you, yes, you could see that on, on a continuum, I guess. Yes. You know, yes. the, the animals that we do eat, which are quite like us, as you would agree, in many ways, um, and yet we, we draw this line and say it's, it's you know, the most revolting, appalling thing you can imagine. To actually eat There's a kind of yuck factor comes in, isn't there? There is, and again, yeah. you know, you could give a, a Darwinian explanation for why we should have some sort of general repulsion about yeah. eating humans. Although obviously some humans have done yes. so. At, uh, now, yes. suppose that we, um, that laboratories of the, of the future, start developing tissue culture methods whereby they can grow in the lab steak, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think few people would have any moral objection to having beef tissue, tissue culture, growing steak in the lab and cutting right. it up and eating it. I suspect that if you grew human tissues in the lab, uh, people would have an objection to that. Oh, that would, that's a very interesting question because you, you're quite right that I would have no moral objection to you know, growing, growing beef I in the lab and I, yeah. and I would be prepared to eat it, I, you know, obviously much better than buying it from an animal who lived a miserable life and was killed. Uh, so if, if you could take a few cells off my skin and grow them in the lab, uh, I wouldn't object to anyone eating them, should I happen to taste uh, good, I don't know. <laughs> and I know that uh, Ingrid Newkirk, who's the, the head of uh, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, has actually said that she would like uh, her body to be eaten. Um, she's making a statement by that, you know, when, when she dies, that, that she would like her friends to, to barbecue her, um, because she's trying to make the point, I guess, that. Uh, this is no, not so different from what people do. In fact, it's morally better than what people do because she would not have been killed for that purpose and would not have been made to suffer for that purpose. Yes, that's a very interesting position. Uh, I think there are cultures in Papua New Guinea and places where that does happen. It, it's a kind of mark of respect to, to, to eat. Right, religion. and there's an account in Herodotus, I think, of uh, Darius, the Persian emperor, um, uh, asking some Indians what they would do with their bodies while there were Greeks there and the Indians said they would eat their, f what the ans their ancestors. Yeah. And the Greeks of course were horrified at that. And then he asked the Greeks what they would do and they said well we would burn them of course. And the Indians were totally horrified yeah. at that. So yeah. I think this is a cultural thing. Yeah. So we really do have to separate out yuck factors which is what so often permeates uh, what, what look like moral arguments and yes. get, get to the moral uh, basis of it. I can think of no moral objection to eating human roadkills, except for the ones that you mentioned, like what would the relatives think about it and would the person himself have wanted it to happen. Uh, but I do worry a bit about slippery slopes, possibly a little bit more than you do. Um, there is, there are barriers I which we've set up in our minds, and certainly the barrier between Homo sapiens and any other species is an artificial barrier in the sense that it's a kind of accident that the evolutionary intermediates happen to be extinct. Nevertheless, it exists. And natural barriers that are there can be useful for preventing slippery slopes. And therefore, uh, I think I can see an, an objection to breaching such a barrier because it would, uh, you're then in a weaker position to stop people going further. I mean, another example might be, suppose you take the, uh, uh, the argument in favor of, abor of abortion up until the baby was 
one year old, say, or mm -hmm. two years old. And so if a, if a baby was one year old and uh, turned out to have some horrible, incurable disease that meant it was going to die in agony in, late, in later life, what about infanticide? Um, morally, I, strictly morally, I can see no objection to that at all. I would be in favor of infanticide. But, but I think I would worry about, um, I think I would wish at least to give consideration to the person who says, well, where does it end? Yes, I can see that there is a, a problem with, um, say, small children, um, partly because we're bonded to them very closely in a way that we're not really bonded to the same extent anyway to the fetus or perhaps even to the, to the newborn infant. But I think when people make slippery slope arguments in this area, you have to appreciate that it, it does go the other way, that precisely because we draw this boundary um, between us and animals, we turn a, a blind eye to all of that animal suffering, as, as you were more or less uh, acknowledging, I think. Um, and that, that, of course, has disastrous consequences Actually. for animals. So that's why, um, I mean, I think I want to reduce the sharpness of that difference. And uh, so one of my uh, you know, objections to a religious viewpoint, of course, is that it, it does reinforce that boundary. I mean, it says that only we were made in the image of God and so on. And, and obviously, you know, neither of us share that view. But I think it's been, on the one hand, perhaps you could say it's given some protection to humans. Um, but on the other hand, uh, it's put the whole of you know, these billions of other sentient beings into this state where we can just use them and, yeah. and abuse them for yeah. our ends. Now, coming back to the question of vegetarianism and uh, meat eating, we exploit non-human animals in various ways, uh, um, farming them for food, farming them for milk, uh, laboratory testing. I presume that uh, for you what matters is how much they suffer, and so um, if the, and uh, as a, would you, would you make some kind of allowance for the value to the whole of humanity and non-humanity of, say, using animals for, for research, would that be a greater value than eating them? Oh, um, yes. yes. I mean, if, if it was serious research, I mean, part of my problem is, of course, I think because we think so little of animals, we could, you know, people do almost anything with them. I mean, uh, fortunately, now we're having less, say, cosmetic testing. But, but still, when you look at experiments that are done, a lot of them, by no stretch of the imagination, could be said to be for you know, some great benefit for, for That's humanity. That's absolutely true. Um, so I think you know, we, we ought to be very tough on yes. those. But, but I would have to acknowledge that it, if there is a real benefit, you know, if you really have some prospect of helping a large number of people who you couldn't help in any other way if we've explored all the other avenues, um, I suppose I would say, uh, yes, you could justify animal testing. But, but I have to say also, because I don't think this species barrier is so important, that if you could make similar progress or even greater progress by testing on a human being with severe brain damage at a similar level, and if the parents, let's say, or the relatives consented to that, I would also say you could justify uh, that. Yeah, again, totally logically consistent. Now, would you agree that far more suffering happens in, in, the, in the food industry, in, in um, factory farming and slaughterhouses and things, than happens in laboratories. And yet, laboratories are, are far more closely controlled, well, perhaps because laboratories are far more closely controlled than, than yes. farms and slaughterhouses. Absolutely, I, I do agree with that. And I think most of the animal movement in the last decade or so has acknowledged that and has started to shift more of its attention to the use of animals for food. I mean, for one thing, the numbers are just overwhelmingly greater. Right. I mean, here in the United States alone, there's something like 10 billion animals that are raised and killed for food each year. Um, whereas I think with animals used in, in research, it's maybe 25, 30, perhaps 40 million. We don't really keep very good statistics in the United States. But, you know, 40 million is against 10 billion. It's, it's very small. Plus, um, as you were saying, in a way, um, on the farms, they're not answerable to anyone. There's, there's really virtually no laws. In fact, in the United States, there is no law saying how many hens can you put in a cage to get eggs. Right. It's, it's just a matter of commercial practice, what you do. And um, 
you know, that does contrast with testing where there is some controls. I don't think the controls are at all. It varies adequate. from country to country. It varies. I mean, country, I, mean yeah. I think in Britain the controls are, are extremely stringent and that, you know, certificates have to be signed and. Well, they're certainly more stringent than they are here. There's yes, no doubt about that. That's yes, right. Yes. Uh, but uh, but uh, undoubtedly, far more suffering goes on in in farms, which which leaves me in a very difficult moral position. I mean, I I, I clearly, you're, I think you have a very very strong point when you when you say that that anybody who eats meat has a very very strong uh, obligation to think seriously about it. And I don't find any very good defence. I find myself in exactly the same position as. Uh, you or I would have been, well probably you wouldn't have been, but I might have been 200 years ago, uh, talking about, I mean 200 years, perhaps a bit, a bit longer ago than that, talking about slavery, where uh, somebody like um, Thomas Jefferson, a man of very sound ethical principles, kept slaves. It was just what one did. I mean, it was yeah. the kind of the, the societal norm. And so you I'm a bit reminded of the Flanders and Swan song, you don't eat people. Do, do, do you know that? that I'm not subject? familiar with that one. I um, it's it's a Flanders and Swan, you know, with that know com Swan, comedy yeah, duo. Yeah. And they had a, 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 a song about a, a cannibal feast. And, and um, one of the young men of the society objected to eating people. He said, pe eat, eating people is, is wrong. And, and so his father sort of put his arm around him and, and, and said, no, don't be silly, son. I mean, you, we, pe people have always been people. If, if the juju hadn't meant us to eat people, he wouldn't have made us of meat. And then, <laughs> and then, right. and the, and the, the, fa the final line is, um, next thing you'll be saying is, is we, sh we shouldn't eat animals. And then the son just roars with laughter. Don't eat animals, what a ridiculous <laughs> idea. Well, um, the, the historical precedent of slavery, I think, is actually rather a good one because, yes. because um, there was a time when it was simply the norm. Uh, everybody did it. Some people did it with, with gusto and relish. Other people, like Jefferson, did it reluctantly. Um, I would have probably done it reluctantly. I would have sort of just gone along with, the, with what society does. But I think it's extremely hard. It was hard to defend then, yet mm. ev everybody did it. And that's the sort of position I find myself in now. And uh, I think what I'd really like to see is um, people like you having a, a far greater effect upon, uh, I would call it consciousness raising really, mm. um, having a, and, and try to swing it round so that it becomes the societal norm uh, not to eat meat. Yes, absolutely. And I, I think what you're talking about is, is the pressure of social conformity. And yes. I think we're very much a conforming animal. And it's very hard to do things sometimes against the prevailing norms. And that's why it was, was hard for people who had some scruples or doubts about slavery to actually imagine that they could abolish it and, and live with that. Uh, so I think that's, uh, you know, we, we, we are making it more acceptable though. I think in a way the animal movement is making progress. I mean, you can walk into any supermarket here and you'll find uh, meat substitutes, meat alternatives, vegetarian dishes, uh, you'll find soy milk of course and, and so on. So it's, it's getting easier and it's getting more socially acceptable and I think we just have to somehow get past that threshold where it, it won't be a difficult decision for people to make at all. It'll simply be something that they can see lots of people do and you know, they'll feel better doing it and, uh, and gradually it will become a thing of the past as slavery has now become a thing of the past. I suppose another thing might be that as it becomes socially the norm, great chefs will develop wonderful right. recipes. I mean, the problem with vegetarian food at the moment is a lot of it isn't very nice. <laughs> well, it gets, it's, it's got better, I think. I think yes. it's got, you know, for, I, I've been a vegetarian now for 35 years. Yes. Um, and when I started, you could certainly have said that, and there were some dreadful things around that people ate, and I was living in Oxford, and uh, you know, English cooking was, was certainly not very good at vegetarian. But, but now, you know, we have some great restaurants in this city, for example. There's some terrific uh, vegan restaurants as well as vegetarian, uh, where I think, you know, you and any other meat eater would really in enjoy the food. Yeah. So we're getting to that point, yeah. I think. What's the connection of Darwin with what we've been talking about, speciesism and so on? I think what Darwin did was to knock out a lot of the foundations for thinking that we humans are so special and that therefore we can do what we do to animals. I mean, uh, you know, previously it made more sense maybe to believe that we were created by God and, you know, the biblical account that actually says, well, we were created last and we were given dominion over the animals and we were made in the image of God and they weren't. 
But if you accept an evolutionary account, then of course that's nonsense. Um, we were not created in the image of any deity, and uh, we were not, you know, nobody gave us permission to use them. We just evolved together with them um, from common ancestors. And, you know, in, in terms of rights, they have as much right to live and enjoy their lives as we have to live and enjoy our lives. Um, so it, it just undercuts all of that separation. And then stresses the continuity and, and the similarities, which, you know, as we were talking about, include the capacity to suffer. Yeah. I mean, Darwin himself laid great stress on the continuity, and he's, a lot of Darwin's argument, his one long argument, is, is um, uh, based upon the need to make humans similar to animals, because he recognized that that was the barrier in understanding that he had to, to get across. So an awful lot of, when, 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 when one's reading Darwin, as you know, you, you, you have to understand that that's what he was trying to do. He yes, was trying and, to and it's make quite, the continuity. quite clear in The Descent of Man that he extends it from just the, the physical and anatomical similarities to um, similarities in our minds, to talking about uh, you know, animal emotions, and he has that wonderful book about the expression of the emotions in man and animals, uh, just talking about similarities of, of, of emotions that, uh, that ours are continuous with theirs. They're a little bit different, they're a bit more developed by the way we are, but that you can f read back these uh, emotions. So, so it's not in a way just the capacity to feel pain in a physical sense, but also capacities to feel um, you know, things like, like boredom, fear, frustration, loneliness maybe, and also to feel love for their others. And he even talks about some kind of uh, religious feeling, if I remember rightly, that you know, maybe you can find some traces of in uh, a dog howling at the moon or, or something of that, of that sort. So yes, I think he did want to stress uh, that continuity, which um, the religious viewpoint had completely separated. I mean, it's interesting when you look at the religious thinkers, like Thomas Aquinas is a good example, um, who, who says, well, we have no duties to animals. We don't even have a duty not to be cruel to them insofar as their suffering is concerned. Because, he says, they don't share with us the uh, communion of everlasting life. In other words, they don't have immortal souls, and we do. Uh, and so he says the only reason why we shouldn't be cruel to animals is because if we're cruel to animals, we might develop a hardened disposition that might lead us to be cruel to humans. Um, and that's all. In other words, the suffering, the pains of the animals for a Christian thinker like Aquinas don't count at all. And I think Darwin is just knocks the foundations out from that. Yes. So maybe what, what I would add to that uh, is that I think, in a way, I've assimilated Darwinism on this issue better than you have. Because um, I think that, that you perhaps are still influenced by these vestiges of religious belief that separate us from the animals and um, and by you know, continuing to eat meat you're part of that general view that that says well we are in some way superior to animals even though you don't really believe the foundations for that view. Yeah. I mean I'm nothing to add to what I said before it's not it's not a matter of not get, getting on board the Darwinism it's, a, it's what we were talking about before on social conformity and, and mm -hmm. uh, just, I mean, I live in a society which is still massively speciesist. Yes. And uh, inter intellectually, I recognize that, but I, but I go along with it the same way I go along with celebrating Christmas and, and right. singing Christmas carols and, and, and things like that. I sometimes have a fantasy of writing a science fiction story in which a relict population of Australopithecus maybe Homo erectus, Australopithecus, uh, perhaps something else back along the chain to the common ancestor with chimpanzees is discovered lurking somewhere in the forests of Africa. Right. And the, the, the purpose of the novel would be to play out the, the implications on society of the, of the rediscovery of Lucy. Uh, would, can you sort of explore what you think might happen if we, if we did discover that? Well, I, I think that would be fascinating because then we would have to raise that question of when does a being have sufficient moral status to be regarded as our equal in law, as a being with full rights and not, as animals still generally are, a, an item of property. Um, and I think, you know, it's a nice idea to imagine that Australopithecus could be discovered. But, you know, there's another possible way in which this could happen, and that is if somebody were to produce a chimpanzee-human hybrid, yeah. we would have the same problem. And, and that, 
as I understand it, is not beyond the realms of scientific possibility. So again, then we, I mean, some people say, well, this would be great because then we could have you know, assistance to help us around the house. But, but what they don't realize is that they're actually recreating slavery uh, here yeah. with a being that's just somewhat more different from you know, the, the white Europeans than, uh, than people of African descent are. Um, I mean, but it's still, you know, um, I don't want to say it's, it's a continuum. I don't want to say that in any way, uh, you know, Africans were, were more like, uh, uh, you know, other animals, of course. But, but I, I do think it's a way of, of just drawing this boundary around who we are. And the racists used to say, well, we are the white Europeans and we're dominant. And if we have Australopithecus or we have a chimpanzee-human hybrid, well, we're going to say, well, that's not us. So we can somehow use and exploit them. But um, really, well, as you were saying, we shouldn't be having that boundary, that line at all. We should just say, let's look at this being. What is it? What can it suffer? What can it experience? And, and its experiences, you know, in many respects are similar to ours. And, and we shouldn't discount it because it's yeah. not uh, like us. Theoretically, we shouldn't need to actually make that hybrid because the, the, the mere fact that we can think about it ought to be enough, oughtn't it, to, to let us have the thought that would follow from it. Yes, in theory, it, it, it absolutely but it, but it, should be. There's no doubt that you actually did it, though. It would have, yeah, it would have a, a bigger, a, big impact. Much more yeah, it would focus dramatic attention impact. on it. Uh, Steve Gould once, once speculated about the possibility of a hybrid between humans and chimps, and he, he added that he could think of no experiment that would be more immoral to do. I couldn't get that. I mean, it seemed to me that it might be a very moral thing to do, precisely because it would have the effect of breaking the barrier uh, mm. of... Um, Ho uh, the, the wall around around Homo sapiens. Well, the, the danger it, it would be immoral if it was done with the purpose of creating an creating experimental slaves. subject or yep. slaves Slave. or something of that sort mm. that you could use irrespective of its interests. But if it was done for the purpose that you're suggesting, um, then yes, it it, it could well, be. It uh, probably would be done just for sheer scientific curiosity. Yeah, but uh, then, uh, the, but the consequence might well be. I mean, it, it surely wouldn't be used as a, as a slave. I mean, it would be, right. but, the, but the consequence might be the, the social effect that we've talked about. But you would be creating a being. I mean, I guess maybe why you all said this, I don't know, is that you would be creating a being who is almost one of a kind and wouldn't quite know, you know, would probably have enough intelligence to understand his or her situation and wouldn't know where he or she belonged. It's, it's like Frankenstein, you know, in, in yeah. Mary Shelley's novel, who, who actually is quite a sad figure, I think, in a way. Not really, you know, a monster, or maybe becomes a monster, but, but is sad because it's been created in this way and, and basically nobody loves uh, Frank, the, the monster. Um, you know, even the creator rejects him. So it, it could be something like Indeed that. Indeed it could, and, and, and that's exactly the kind of reason why it, it might be I immoral. But I suspect that most people would think it immoral for pure yuck reasons. Yes, no, I, I, I don't agree with that. And, yeah. uh, you know, I think that's... I think we, we have to think through what actually would be objectionable about it. And un undoubtedly, the creature itself would have a horrible life because it would be a, an object of, it would be like a sort of circus freak. And, and yes, it would, uh, yes, exactly. It would be like one of these, I don't know, uh, you know, yeah, Africans brought to Europe or something uh, when Africans were first discovered or, or Native Americans. Paraded around as, right, as, a, as a curiosity. As a, as a, yeah. What is speciesism? Speciesism is an attitude of prejudice towards beings because they're not members of our species. So just as racism means that you're prejudiced against beings who are not members of your race, and sexism means you're prejudiced against people of the other sex. So we humans tend to be speciesists, and we think that any being that is a member of the species Homo sapiens just automatically has a higher moral status and is more important than any being that is a member of any other species, irrespective of the actual characteristics of those beings. Thank you.